Hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining us during the Lithum Partners Spring 2023 Investor Conference. My name is Adam Lowensteiner, Vice President of Lithum Partners. During this fireside chat, we welcome LB Foster, ticker symbol of FSTR, that is Foxtrot Sierra Tango Romeo, on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. Today, we are joined by the members of the LB Foster senior management team to discuss the status of the industry and what the company is experiencing in the current economic environment. Today's guests are John Castle, President and Chief Executive Officer, and Bill Tallman, Chief Financial Officer. Before we begin, for those not familiar, Lithum Partners is one of the country's leading investor relations firms. With more than two decades of corporate access experience, we've built one of the industry's most diverse and effective platforms for connecting small cap companies with high quality and focused institutional investors while creating a framework of best practices in all aspects of investor relations. Today's discussion is hopefully yet another example where we can bring value to multiple constituents. We will dive into the discussion in a moment, but one final item, I wanna remind everyone that LBF Foster is available for one-on-one -on -one meetings. And if you haven't already signed up, please send me an email at lowensteiner at lithumpartners.com or visit www.lithumpartners.com forward slash virtual and click the one-on-one -on -one meeting request button. As a reminder, today's discussion may include forward-looking statements and actual company results may differ. Please refer to the most recent 10K and 10Q for a full list of risk factors. With that said, let's begin. So, John and uh, Bill, welcome. Um, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourselves and about LB Foster? Yeah, great. First of all, thanks everybody for joining us today. We're excited to uh, reach out to you and talk to you. It's exciting times in the LB Foster company and, and uh, we really appreciate your time and attention. So I'm John Castle. I'm president and CEO of LB Foster. I've been with the company now. It's my 20th, uh, 21st year heading into. I uh, had multiple facets or, or uh, positions in the company, from running operations to running products to running health and safety uh, to being chief operating officer, uh, then named president and CEO uh, just about two years ago. Bill? Yep, thanks, John. Um, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bill Tallman. I'm a chief uh, financial officer of the company. Uh, I joined LB Foster a little over two years ago. Um, got a, about 35 years of uh, diversified financial experience, a combination of uh, operations finance, uh, corporate finance, and and also some operational P&L responsibility over uh, over my career. And uh, as John indicated, uh, exciting times here at LB Foster. We've been uh, doing quite a bit uh, ever since I joined the organization and look forward to giving everybody an update today. Okay, so LB Foster is uh, headquartered in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That's where Bill and I are talk speaking to you to, uh, from you to, for, <laughs> to you today. Uh, the company was founded over 120 years ago, in fact, in 1902, uh, by four, uh, four members of the Foster family. Uh, it's pivoted and changed a lot over the last 10, 15 years since from really a steel distribution sales company into a, a global technology a solutions provider. Really heavy focus is now on engineering and manufacturing products. And we've taken those products and uh, extended into service offerings. And uh, the, what we're really excited about today is how that really lines up well with the infrastructure marketplace that are happening in North America and really across the world, the markets we serve. Those markets are North America, South America, Europe, and Asia. Of our 1,100 employees, um, there are a number of segments that we'll talk to you about today, specifically in the rail and concrete precast side. Uh, we work with very small customers to contractors to very, very large customers, including government authorities across the world. And uh, as we, we published earlier uh, in the year, um, we came out with guidance and we're, our guidance is ranging between 520 to 550 million in, in revenue and EBITDA uh, between 27 and $30 million. So before we drill down into discussing the future of infrastructure, the company has seen a lot of movement uh, in the last past 24 months or so initiated with a strategic reassessment. Can you spend a moment to discuss the moves that were made and, and how that has reshaped the company and are there any more moves expected? Yeah, great. So I'll start off because, uh, you know, as I was ch uh, chief operating officer and heading into my role as president and CEO, I, I had a really good handle of the company in the roles I had leading up to, you know, the prior 18 years. 
Uh, but we really didn't have a good handle was really the strategy uh, and really understanding core competence of where we needed to go. So in 2021, we came, uh, we worked with a, a small boutique firm um, called TRC Advisory out of Chicago and really mapping out what it is that they'll be fostered, where we added our value uh, and where the growth really comes from. And they understand where we wanted the capital to be deployed and really drive that shareholder return. So we've done a number of things and I will turn it over to Bill, but uh, the last 18 months we've been very, very busy. Our portfolio has changed. Our, uh, we came out with um, you know, where we're at related to finishing the year, uh, as well as our first quarter. And you see a nice step up is not just on the revenue side, but also on the profitability side. So we're exciting these, we're excited that our strategy is in play, it's in motion. Uh, and it really lines up well with the earlier guidance that I shared with you. So, Bill, maybe a little color on sure. the, the moves we made. Yep. Yeah, we um, uh, we announced the strategy uh, rollout uh, in uh, December of 2021, and, and shortly before that strategy uh, uh, event, uh, we we had divested our piling business, uh, which was a transaction that was completed uh, towards the end of 2021. And um, that was the what I would call the first watershed move that we made that uh, created the momentum behind the strategy that uh, is is in play at the moment. Um, and and you know really the focus has been on looking at uh, parts of the portfolio that are uh, underperforming or no longer core to what LB Foster is going to be in the long term, and uh, and adding to the portfolio in areas where. Uh, we feel like we have a right to win. We have good product technologies that serve those markets well, and there's market um, headspace for us to grow uh, over a longer period of time. Uh, so the strategy defined those those growth platforms as rail technologies and precast concrete. Um, as uh, we mentioned, we did uh, several divestitures uh, since the rollout of the stra strategy piling in 21. Uh, we also divested track components uh, in the summer of 22, and we just recently announced the divestiture of the Chemtech business, which uh, reduces our exposure to the energy uh, space, which was a very specific move that uh, was contemplated within the strategy. And at the same time, we added three acquisitions that fit very squarely where we want to grow. Uh, in our growth platforms. And namely, that's the Van Husco acquisition that we completed in August of last year. And then two acquisitions that we completed last year over in the UK, um, Scratch and IV, which are part of the rail technologies platform. Um, so we're really pleased with the activity. Uh, a lot of heavy lifting in late 21 and, and throughout 2022. And, uh, you know, we're excited on the opportunities we see in front of us. I guess the last thing I'd say on the transformation work that's been done, um, you know, we're really focused on organic growth at this point. Uh, we, we feel as though we've got a solid platform from which to grow, and we, got ha we have very clear line of sight on the areas where we can grow in the portfolio that we have today. So, so one could view the company now as a pure play infrastructure company participating in three buckets, so to speak, rail products and technologies, precast concrete products, and steel infrastructure products. Can you discuss the benefits of each and what kind of project flow are you currently currently experiencing in each? Yeah, yeah great question. And, you know, when you look internally uh, and then you look at the company externally, sometimes the company can be a little confusing because we're doing so many different things in so many different markets. But Adam, you're absolutely right. Uh, at the end of the day, we do support and underpin the infrastructure market. And now with engineering solutions that we're <coughs> doing and service offerings, that's what differentiates ourselves today. Rail, so the company, when I said that we've been around since 1902, it started in rail. So rail is really where we've been. Um, but it, it was much more of a commodity play. It's more of a track components uh, type offering in the past. In the last 20, 30 years, we turned that into a technology uh, a play. And we also moved from North America into global markets. So, you know, we're shipping products today outside of North America. And I mentioned those countries earlier. Uh, but we're doing it with technology in mind. Uh, so we're able to offer our company fuel savings better safety. I'm sure someday time we'll talk about safety today, 
better safety, uh, enabling safety for the markets and their customers, and, and the ability to just uh, reduce their uh, their overall costs, if you will. And, and then we added some something really exciting on the UK side of the rail business, and we brought that in 2015 with the two products and two engineering business. So we, we moved off the OEM, off the rail, into the, uh, the customer experience. So now we're able to touch many different facets of what we do and how we do it. Um, and so we have dis digital display technology today. We have wayside finding information today. And we thought, we, and we'll talk, I'm sure, about this more with acquisitions, but we wanted to even take that enhancement uh, through the rail um, passenger's experience in the terminal, outside of the terminal, and do that through digital media and displays through a company called Scratch. So we really have taken something very, very uh, finite and uh, something that was not really growable, especially as you look at things like margin um, and more commoditized products. And we take them into something that we can add technology, add some service offerings to it and bring it into global markets. That's what the rail looks like today. Precast came to us about 25 years ago through uh, an acquisition we did for CXT Incorporated. At that time, it was made up of two businesses that produced two products. One is concrete ties and the other being uh, precast buildings. And what we found over time is as uh, concrete ties kind of come and go in the U.S. markets, primarily of the 20 million products that sold on an annual basis, you know, a good part of those are wood today, not concrete. So we have pivoted from concrete uh, ties and in the rail side into the, the um, precast markets. We're making buildings today for state, federal, uh, county um, parks. And we're also now in heavily into infrastructure play as it relates to building uh, cities, homes, and industrial parks. So we're very excited about that opportunities um, as it complements the rail business we're doing extremely, extremely well. And the steel infrastructure has been with the company for a long period of time as well. Um, and that's when, you know, things like the bridges that we're seeing and all the highway work that we've done and, and, uh, and that continues to go. We hope to see much more of that with the Infrastructure Jobs Act here in North America. Uh, that we saw, you know, passed in Congress a very short period of time ago. But we're hoping that that uh, those opportunities, as well as what we're, what we're seeing in North America and Europe, really give the opportunity to uh, springboard the spring the company into the future with growth, uh, both at top line and bottom line. Bill, anything you'd like to add? On that? Yeah, I, I think the only thing I'd highlight is uh, within that steel uh, products and measurement division. Uh, the measurement piece of that was Chemtech. Obviously, we divested that earlier in the in the year, um, and so you know what's what's remaining in that portfolio is is the bridge business, as uh, John had indicated, that will benefit from infrastructure. But there's also uh, a coatings business within that uh, that product line that uh, has uh, in the past been a very robust uh, portion of the business for us, and uh, went through a bit of a rough patch. Uh, in the, during the pandemic and, and shortly after there with a, uh, a downturn in investment within the, within the uh, pipeline infrastructure space. And uh, we're starting to see a little bit of a renaissance in that area whereby uh, it would be a combination of, of uh, traditional applications for rail, um, or sorry, pipeline uh, infrastructure, but then also the uh, renewable carbon sequestration uh, initiatives that are out there uh, that we're uh, beginning to get some participation in and has the potential for being a bit more robust in the future. So, you know, we have a, a pretty diverse uh, uh, product offering and solutions offering that touches many, many different areas of infrastructure. So while the company is involved in infrastructure, it has many products that incorporate new technologies. Can you describe some of them for the audience and their importance? And also, do these products offer recurring revenue opportunities or do they have growth opportunities attached to them? Yeah, they sure do have. Um, let me take you down maybe a, a level from where we were on the last question and talk specifically with some of the products that we uh, provide today uh, with this, you know, the respective markets. So friction management is something uh, that we brought in uh, through the PortTech acquisition back in 2010. 
and it, it wasn't really something we understood at the time. We we thought it had some value um, to our offerings of extending the life of the products we sold and giving our customers, uh, both on the OEM side as the passengers on the transit side, a better experience uh, and better ride. What we really didn't appreciate was uh, how it enables safety and also how it enables uh, fuel savings. So that's something we've been working with our customers, both on the transit and the freight side for a number of years of getting as much of this product uh, onto their track systems, both on freight as well as the transit side. So it reduces noise as the trains coming in and out of the um, cities. It, it also provides the ability for the trains to stop when they need to stop coming into, you know, up to a crossing or more importantly, coming into a station. Um, and it's got, it manages the steel relationship between the wheel and the rail, uh, which reduces friction, which is, you know, noise, but also uh, provides a better uh, coefficient related to make sure those trends, trains are running with the least amount of fuel, or uh, in this case, in this case, most times they're running on a uh, diesel fuel. So it has a significant um, opportunity for, um, for our customers to really add some value to what they're doing today without spending a lot of money. To us though, uh, it's about the applicator, it's about the razor blade, if you will, and the razor, that's our strategy. So we sell both the razor and the razor blade. Um, the razor blade is our, um, is our IP. It's what separates ourselves from the competition. It's what we develop and design. Um, that's the consumable that goes into the track lab applicator um, that's used again across not just North America, but uh, many uh, places around the world. And it's also an area that we're looking to um, mobilize over time and, and bring it off the track and put it actually on the train, uh, be it a transit train or freight train. We're operating that in a couple small regions today and we look to expand that in the future. Very exciting. Um, load impact detection uh, is a product that comes out of our salient um, systems. It's uh, wheel impact load detection. So, you know, kind of the hot topic today is, is really looking at trains and the safety on tra of trains and understanding if, the, if something's happened specifically in that truck structure where an impact happened or something's out around or the train is called hunting, which is moving back and forth or it's got an unstable load, um, our devices help our, our customers able to detect that. Um, so we've been producing this product for many, many years. We have a large installed base across North America, and we just introduced a new technology and a new generation of product that we're beginning to work with our customers and we're launching uh, this year in North America. So we're very excited about that. The last thing I'll tell you on, on, that, on the rail side is, um, obstacle detection. So trains stop for multiple reasons. One of the reasons they stop is because there's an obstacle on the track. In many areas, uh, the technology is very limited. Um, in fact, in some cases, nothing. So we were able to produce something, design something in the UK, bring it over to North America, where it detects obstacles on the track and gives the our train operators the opportunity to do something about it, to really understand what's, what's in front of them, either slow the train down stop the train or in this particular in many cases um, keep the train running because they can understand what the obstacle is and it won't uh, cause them inter interference so it's kind of the eyes and ears on track uh, that uh, we're bringing this technology as you can see what i talked about before with technology engine engineering and all the innovation uh, these are the type of things we're talking about and the opportunity to take this company and what we're doing today and make it much more scalable in Europe, back in 2015, I, I mentioned earlier, we, we purchased a company called Two Engineering. Um, in the beginning of the year, in the end of the year, we bought a company called Two Plus. Two Plus was the service center uh, doing the contract services. So that also now brought us all this wonderful technology we're talking about on the product side. It was to enable or give us the opportunity to come up with a service revenue side. Uh, and that's what Two Plus has been able to do. So if you've been following our company, you understand that we've been busy working on Crossrail in the UK for a number of years, actually the last eight years. And we're kind of at a, the period between that project and the next major project in the UK called HS2. So we're excited about that opportunities and uh, continue to grow our brand and our scale uh, connecting, um, which is HS2 is connecting London to Birmingham. So that's good stuff.
maybe you want to take the precast side up. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, precast business is a uh, is a uh, is a nice growth platform for us. Um, Today, it's comprised of what we would call our legacy business, which was three operating plants uh, that uh, generate approximately $90 million in revenue. Uh, the, the cornerstone of that uh, product offering is our CXT branded buildings, uh, which are used for public restrooms, concession stands, uh, utility buildings, a variety of different applications. And uh, you know we've had that product line for quite a while, and we do a, a variety of other products for uh, water management and bridge beams and and, and um, uh, sound walls and things of that nature in that product line. And and you know that's been a nice steady business for us. It's been growing with uh, some of the the funding that's been out there. In particular, the Great American Outdoors Act has been a nice catalyst for uh, demand for that product line. And uh, just uh, as I indicated earlier, back in uh, August of last year, we completed uh, the acquisition of the Van Husco business, which added approximately $40 million worth of revenue. And uh, the, one of the things that's really attractive about the Van Husco business is it's really focused more so on industrial and commercial applications and uh, opportunity for uh, a slightly better margin profile versus our traditional business, which we're working on our margin profile in our traditional business and making some very good progress, which you can see in our results. Uh, but the Van Husco product line and product offering was a nice enhancement to what we already had. And uh, you know, the cornerstone of that product uh, offering is the EnviroCast wall system, where it's an insulated wall system. Uh, so versus uh, uh, building a concrete building and having to stick build uh, and install installation to uh, create the uh, the thermal factor that you're looking for in uh, a particular building, uh, it's already embedded in the wall system. And uh, those walls can be delivered to the job site and you're significantly reducing the amount of time that it takes to construct and bring up to uh, the, the project timeline, the, the, the walls and the building that's needed for a particular project. So that's a uh, it's relatively recent acquisition. Uh, we've had it for less than a year. Uh, it's been performing very, very well ever since we've uh, uh, completed the acquisition. Uh, we see opportunities to bring some of those product lines into our existing facilities. And uh, we also see some pretty attractive growth opportunities uh, taking those product lines into other areas of the, the regions that we serve and or can easily access. So that's uh, where one of our focus areas is going forward is the organic growth opportunities we see in precast business, uh, specifically related, related to the Van Husco acquisition. Can you discuss why your backlog has been growing and, and what are the status of the infrastructure markets that LB Foster caters to? Or how are they performing right now? And also, are, are there any key pieces of legislation that call for infrastructure improvements that might be catalysts for your businesses? Okay, I'll, I'll take the front end of that. So, you know, going into COVID, ridership specifically on the transit side went down to, you know, very low levels. And freight and commodity movements went down to extremely, you know, lowest in history levels. We're seeing a, a rebound in that. Um, here in North America, ridership's up to about 60% of pre-pandemic levels. We expect in the coming months that'll hit around 80, 85%. And the other markets in the UK and Western Europe, as well as Asian markets we participate in, they're they're close to 100% uh, ridership. So we're seeing a big uptick now of getting back to pre-pandemic levels. It's, it looks very good, very encouraging. But you know, the overarching thing is during COVID, uh, everybody kind of did as is they did as much as they needed to, but also as the little. Um, not not as much as we have done historically because of the amount of movement of passengers or freight. So we're in a little bit of a catch-up mode now. So a lot of the maintenance type work that maybe was deferred because it didn't have the traffic is now starting to happen. So our activities, you know, it's as strong as I've seen since I've been with the company in 20 years, really across the board. And now that we're much closer to a pure play that you talked about earlier, Adam, you know, these are infrastructure plays to us today. So we're seeing across the board, very, very strong backlog. Uh, this is really, a, one is a catch up and two things are getting back to somewhat normal coming out of COVID. 
And a third piece is just looking at what we have here in North America. You know, if you look at our infrastructure, the ASCE report card from 2021, you know, we have a C minus, and that's just, you know, that was a couple of years ago. So work needs to be done. It's been kind of uh, shelled, if you will, or slowed down due to COVID and all the other supply chain and labor disruption issues. So we have a, quite a bit of pent up demand. And of course you got the Infrastructure Jobs Act that uh, that is significant. Uh, but the honest answer is we're seeing a lot of work related to surveys. Uh, we're seeing a lot of work related to taking you know, quotations, uh, but we're not seeing a lot of bookings coming that's turning into buildings as of yet. We expect that to change uh, between now and the end of this year and heading into next year. So there's a lot of pent up demand, there's a lot of excitement, and we have a lot of products that are needed uh, to restore the infrastructure and rebuild the infrastructure, um, not just here in North America, but other parts of the world. Bill? Yeah, I don't know if I'd add a whole lot more to that other than to say, again, as we kind of talked about earlier on, um, you know, the, the, the spending levels have been uh, curtailed for a period of time and funding is available and it's starting to make its way through the system and uh, we're seeing an increase in activity and, you know, I think uh, our second quarter, or sorry, our first quarter results, you know, we reported 16% uh, net growth on a year over year basis on the top line and and um, 11, a little over 11% organic growth. And uh, so, you know, we're seeing the benefits of some of those things uh, starting to come in uh, to our financials, but uh, we expect to see more in the coming uh, quarters. So, you know, we're excited about it. Uh, we're ready to serve and we feel like uh, we're gonna benefit it for a period of time here. How's the company managing today's inflationary environment and supply chain disruptions? Has that caused any pricing pressures at all? Oh, sure has. Uh, you know, some of the work we've been doing um, in the past, especially in the last year, 18 months, we, um, you know, part of backlog is uh, is a good thing, but also can be constrained, uh, meaning you don't have the ability to get uh, price equal to cost. Um, so being who we are and a good customer and, um, um, uh, being a good supplier to a customer, you know, we worked through those times um, and we, you know, it was difficult, but we did our best to make sure we're getting product in the hands of our customers, as well as really working those, you know, shoring up those supply chains. You know, years heading into this COVID, we were really working with how do, how do we limit the amount of suppliers we have and working with one or two suppliers. Uh, you know, that was kind of the thing to do, make sure you had the best pricing leverage you had. Well, in COVID, that was that didn't work out too well. Didn't work out too well for us. So we got um, we got agile during uh, COVID. We started looking at new supply chains. We started domesticating as much product as we could. We started looking at other engineering solutions. Uh, we came out of COVID uh, much, much stronger than we were heading into COVID from a disruption point of view. And our teams did a great job of, of where we could get price um, equal to inflation, if not better than inflation. We, we've done a good job of going out and doing that as well. So it, it took us a while. Uh, there was a quite quite a shock to the system, uh, especially if you look at the labor input too and uh, all the disruption of getting people to and from work. Uh, people want to be at LB Foster because of our culture, but it was still it was difficult to get the operating centers back to where they needed to be, make sure that we did appropriate measures uh, for the pandemic, keeping people safe. Um, and we came out of that really pretty good shape. So we're feeling pretty good about uh, where we're at today, being able to uh, hold the gains, I will call it, Adam, um, and continue to build that, uh, that nice margin uplift that we had in Q1 and continue to build on that in Q2 and beyond. So we have time for maybe a few more questions here. I want to hit on um, high-speed rail projects. Uh, there are several extremely high visible high-speed rail projects in the works, both in the U.S. and the U.K., you know, specifically speaking, Miami to Orlando, L.A. to San Francisco, L.A. to Las Vegas, and the HS2 project in the U.K. that you mentioned, John. Um, as these come online, probably you know more will be planned but these are very large infrastructure projects. What What's your role? What's LB Foster's role? And if so, how large of an opportunity can these be for the company? Well, they're significant. We've been, you know, some of these have been on the drawing board for a long, long period of time. The one I will tell you that we know is coming is HS2. That's definitely happening. It's just a question of when 
uh, we'll see the work um, and, and turn the, that work and activity into buildings. We project that we'll start seeing that by the end of this year into strong into next year. And we look that project to go on for eight to 10 years at least. Uh, mm -hmm. So that really, really looks good for us, HS2. These other projects have been talked about, they're big projects. Um, so Adam, you know, they'll come to us looking for our real products. You know, it could be rail, it could be ties, it could be track uh, uh, products themselves. Um, so, you know, we're in the middle of all those things. Um, and, uh, you know, we got good customers, we got good suppliers that are going to make it happen when they happen, if if they happen. happen. Uh, so, you know, it's too early the call. Uh, I do think a lot of these projects are great. I think they're great for North America. Uh, we've seen a couple small projects happen, you know, across the years in Florida and other parts of North America. Uh, when these come, if they come, you know, we're going to be well positioned to uh, reap the benefits uh, you know, for the company. And they will be sizable projects for our company. And I think the role, the moves that we have made over the last couple of years really shore that up. So if the opportunity comes, we'll be well positioned to maximize on them. So to, to, to conclude here and wrap up the discussion, what, what should investors be look, on the lookout for the coming quarters? And uh, is there anything that I didn't hit upon that you'd like to share with investors before we end the discussion? Yeah, I think uh, maybe I'll let Bill, I'll flip it over to Bill, but the one thing I always remind people, and uh, just because of the type of our products, and we're trying to work on it, is uh, level it out a little bit of seasonality. But a lot of stuff that we do either uh, gets built or installed, you know, in the, in the spring, summer, fall months. So the first quarter is, can be a little light, and the fourth quarter can be a little light. Um, as we become a little more technology type company, we have more service offerings and those type of things that may change. But, you know, this, the second and third quarter historically has been the big bell curve event for us. And look for that to continue uh, this year um, in the second, third quarter. You want to get a little more yeah, color sure. on that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, I think probably the first highlight would be is that, uh, as John indicated earlier, with, uh, with the pricing constraints and, and some of the uh, delays that it took to get uh, price moves into the uh, into the commercial work, uh, end of the business, um, you know, we really didn't start to see the benefits of the transformation work as well as our margin improvement actions until the third quarter of last year. And um, so we saw a nice bump in profitability at that point, uh, Q3 of last year, uh, which was a robust quarter for us. Um, and then, uh, you know, Q4, seasonally a little bit softer uh, in Q1 as well, uh, but strong year-over-year -year improvement in both of those quarters. So we would say for the last three quarters, we've put some significant points on the board in terms of expanding profitability and growth in the business, combination of uh, the impact of the portfolio moves as well as the uh, uh, improvements we've made in the legacy business. And uh, as John indicated, the second and third quarter is our, our quarters are our straight, seasonally strong quarters. And we would expect to continue to uh, see that uh, improvement uh, continue as uh, the year progresses and, and uh, we continue to reap the benefits of the work that we've done. Um, you know, we, we remain focused on ensuring that we're disciplined in our capital allocation uh, our primary focus is to continue to uh, uh, work off the uh, debt level that was uh, put in place with the acquisitions that were completed. Uh, we improved uh, uh, we improved our gross leverage ratio four tenths of a turn in Q1, uh, and we expect to continue to make progress uh, through the balance of the year in terms of reducing overall debt levels as well as as uh, gross leverage. Um, I will say Q2 typically is a higher working capital uh, period uh, because of the uh, rampant sales that we typically see. Uh, so we might not have as in, uh, strong of an improvement in Q2, uh, but uh, we do expect to make progress as the year progresses and uh, we'll mean, be maintaining a disciplined approach in our moves on a going forward basis. John and Bill, thank you very much for your time today. We we greatly appreciate it. To anyone else out, out there who, who still wants to meet with the management team and sign up for a one-on-one, again, please send me an email at lowensteinerlithampartners.com. 
uh, or visit www.lithiumpartners.com forward slash virtual and click on the one on one meeting request button. We hope you all enjoy the conference and, and thank you very much. Sure. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.